its headlines, Prime Minister Barrow clears the air on the Fathers Road Rehabilitation Project. The bill to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana passes in the House, as well as three land bills, and we take a look at the roles of justices of the peace. These stories and more on this week's edition of Belize Now. Thanks for joining us on this Friday, October 20th, 2017. I'm Miriam Longsworth. On Wednesday, October 18th, Prime Minister Right Honorable Dean Barra hosted a press conference at the Best Western Biltmore Plaza in Belize City to clarify misconceptions surrounding the recent contract for the reconstruction of Fathers Road. Prime Minister Barra spoke of the urgency in commencing the project. Fathers Road is in such bad shape. It is such a critical artery to the port, used now by people not just from the south or from the west, but from the north because they cut across the Chatham Isle Street Bridge. Apart from everything else, in terms of the cost of cement, the cost of material, uh, but also the scope of works, please, I ask the me members of the media and the public to remember that nowadays, everything, when you talk to any international funding agency about financing any kind of infrastructure project, they will tell you that the name of the game is building climate resilient infrastructure. The case that we made for this fast tracking of the project out of phase three was the case of extreme urgency. Now, those of you who say even in getting approval, or forget the getting of approval, that no matter what, you should have taken this to the open tender procedure. When we checked with the engineers, the open tender procedure takes between 90 and 130 days. If we had gone to do that, we would have undercut the very argument we were making that we need to proceed on the basis of urgency. Chartered engineer and consultant under the Project Execution Unit at the Ministry of Works, Evandale Moody, gave an overview of the works to be completed under the $8 million Belize dollar project. The scope of works generally for Farber's Road entails the construction of 3.8 kilometers of line, sidewalk, side drain. These are exactly the same side drains that were building on Philip Golson right outside this hotel. Same standard, and in my mind, because we could do the same thing for south side, Farber's Road, which is on the north side, should deserve nothing less. So I've implemented the same criteria, the same design on Farber's Road. Also, we're constructing a rigid concrete pavement, 2.5 kilometers in length, and we're constructing a 1.6 kilometer length of trapezoidal earthen canal. Moody further detailed how Emer Hernandez Development Company won the bid for the project. Four main factors that is key to demonstrating exactly how I came up with the approximate figure that the tender came in at. One, the main item there is the line, concrete, sidewalk, side drain. 3.8 kilometers. 3,800 meters, over 10,000 feet. The rate that was submitted by Emer Hernandez was at $1,091 per meter. 3,800 meters by $1,091 per meter gives you $4.1 million. That's just the dream. We haven't talked about the street. We haven't talked about the canal. Just the sidewalk, side drain. Same standard that we're building outside of the hotel right now. Exact. For comparison, the same drains that we're constructing, we've constructed before, and we're doing it right now. On Philip Golson Highway, the same drain, exact same size, same depth, same specifications, is costing us $1,282 per meter. Right now, same dream, 
I haven't changed the specifications. I haven't changed the design. A year ago, same dream for the construction of the Farber's Road roundabout and the Chetaman Street roundabout, which I designed as well. Same dream. The rate at that time was $900 per meter. Same standard, same specification. If you look at those three rates, the rate from Emir Hernandez Development Company is comparable. The entire scope of works for the project was submitted and approved by the OPEC Fund for International Development, OFID, as a part of the Southside Poverty Alleviation Project Phase 3. The bill to amend the Misuse of Drugs Act was passed at today's meeting of the House of Representatives. The next step is for debate and ratification in the Senate, officially making it law. Janelle Mencia sat down with the Attorney General to get a better understanding of the Act. Introduce a bill for an act to amend the Misuse of Drugs Act, Chapter 103 of the Substantive Laws of Belize, Revised Edition 2011, to decriminalize the possession of cannabis in amounts not exceeding 10 grams, to provide for the imposition of monetary and non recordable penalties for the possession of cannabis in such amounts occurring on school premises in specified circumstances to decriminalize the smoking of cannabis on private premises and to provide for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. The decriminalization of marijuana has been a buzz since the bill was officially introduced to the House of Representatives on August 18, 2017. But there has been much misconception about what the proposed amendments to the Misuse of Drugs Act are. The Attorney General, Honorable Michael Perfit, cleared the air. The cabinet came to the conclusion that marijuana is being smoked. It is not proven to be any more dangerous than any other widely accepted legal drug. And so we wanted to ensure that people who are smoking small amounts of marijuana are not being arrested or detained or charged by the police. But we must emphasize that it is focused to help adults. We're saying that if you have 10 grams or less of marijuana in your possession and you are an adult and you're not on a school premises, then that will be, that will be legal. And also, it is totally legal to smoke marijuana provided you don't smoke it in public. You smoke it in your home, or you smoke it on premises or the home of somebody you know who gives you permission to smoke the marijuana on their premises. As the Attorney General mentioned, the proposed law is for the benefit of adults, and as such, it will still be unlawful for any person under 18 to be in possession of marijuana. If you're a child, and, and we catch you with 10 grams or less of marijuana in your pocket one day, we um, plan to deal with you um, in an alternative way, not, not the prison way, not, not, not the fine way, not the court system way. Like I said, you could be minor training, um, cut some yard, paint some schools, do some public service. If we continually find you with marijuana, then we will have to say, well, you have an addiction problem. Because then remember, we are protecting people who are not adults. So once we determine that you have an addiction problem, then at that point, then we can then recommend you for some sort of rehabilitation. What about marijuana for medical purposes? It's interesting to, for people to know um, that there has always been medical marijuana on the books of Belize, from ever since. Um, this law doesn't make legal no medical marijuana. It has always been the case that if you're a licensed practitioner, you could issue or prescribe marijuana for people who medically require it. So that has always been on the law books. Um, no doctor has ever applied to be licensed for it to dispense it, but it has always been there. And another issue that will not be changed, that will remain. Another issue will be the industrial hemp. Um, the definition of cannabis, uh, cannabis has been adjusted to leave out industrial hemp. So now industrial hemp will become totally legal for people for agricultural um, purposes 
or for clothing or stuff like that. And for those who have criminal records for the possession of small amounts of marijuana, well, there's hope, but there is also a catch. If you, in the past, have been convicted of possession of marijuana, for example, and the fine was less than $1,000, then we, you can apply for your record to be expunged so that that no longer forms a part of your record. Because we're saying that if you were fined less than $1,000, then clearly it was a very small amount that you were fined to be in possession of. When asked about the stats on the number of cases related to marijuana charges, the Honorable Perfeet had this to say. We haven't done any um, exact research to see how many marijuana cases you have, but done a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And, and, and the magistrates have been telling us um, it's a lot. The police have been telling us. So they're saying that they, they're not proposing or encouraging use of marijuana, but it will help them a long way in law enforcement if it's one less minor thing they would have to worry about. While the proposed law will grant relief to responsible adults who want to enjoy marijuana in the comfort of private spaces, the Attorney General encourages all to be responsible. We're hoping that people will approach the law responsibly. We're hoping that people will see that the act does not give you full and <laughs> clear freedom to just do what you want with marijuana. You still can't grow it. You still can't process it. You still can't buy it or sell it commercially. If you have to happen to have it, 10 grams or less, in your home smoking it, then you're home free. But it is not something that we are encouraging all we're saying is that people do it, people already do it, it, it we're, we're filling up the, the, the court system and the judicial system with unnecessary, you know, non-violent situations. Let's ease the pressure of the police and, and, and the community and let us tackle some more serious crime. It is extremely important to note that the law refers to the possession of 10 grams or less. Persons caught with more than 10 grams but less than 60 grams will be charged with possession. For 60 grams or more, they will be considered to be trafficking and will be dealt with to the full extent of the law. For Belize Now, I am Janelle Mencius. After the break, more stories. Stay with us. This is a message from the Belizean Youth for Road Safety in collaboration with the Belize Road Safety Initiative and BEM. When you reach that delight, take heed, reduce speed. Hold up when you reach that delight, take heed, reduce speed. Hold up when you reach that delight, hold up, hold up when you reach that delight. Wait till it change up when you reach that delight, hold up, hold up when you reach that delight. Wait till it change up. Hey. Red means stop. Green means go. When you see the yellow, then the time for goes slow. Some people like rush, why they mafia act so? Your destination got nowhere to go. Look out, the people where they walk across the road. Look out, the people where they ride across the road. When you're walking, look out for the hand signs slow. The pedestrian signal will die. When you reach that light, take heed, reduce speed. Hold up when you reach that light, take heed, reduce speed. Hold up when you reach that the light. Hold up, hold up when you reach that the light. Wait till the change up when you reach that the light. Hold up, hold up when you reach that the light. Wait till the change up. Justices of the Peace. Who are they and what are their duties? Belize now sat down with a representative from the Attorney General's Ministry to find out more. An allegiance to Belize and will uphold the Constitution and the law and that I will conscientiously. Belize has approximately 4,000 justices of the peace. In Old England, a justice of the peace would be a judge who could sentence people to jail or even death. Here in Belize, in more modern times, a justice of the peace plays a much different role. What is that role? 
We spoke to Brianna Williams, Crown Counsel in the Attorney General's Ministry, and Adrian Madrid, President of the Association of the Justices of the Peace, who told us more. There's a long list of things that they can do, um, but for the most part what we see is um, Justice of the Peace executing documents or signing or witnessing documents. So, for example, there are certain documents that you may need um, when you're doing stuff at the Immigration Department, and it'll, you'll see that it says you'll need a Justice of the Peace to sign off on it. They are required to be at a ID parade in criminal matters if there's a, a, an issue of identification. A Justice of the Peace will be there um, while they're, they're carrying out the, the parade. Um, a Senior Justice of the Peace can marry um, people. They do have to get the required license, but they, they can conduct marriages. So much values that, that, that the, the, the JP have, and uh, one of the main things I believe is, is your, your, your code of conduct, um, code of ethics, the way you dress, the way you conduct yourself in public. Mr. Madrid emphasizes that there are certain ways in which a justice of the peace should execute his or her duties. When you sign these documents, you have to read it to be sure that you're signing the proper places. Because what happens is that when, if you don't do it properly, then it goes to the department that requires that information, and then you're turned back. So what we try to do is to work along with, the, the, let's say, the immigration department, social security, vital statistics, and we, we try to meet with them and ask them, how do you need these forms filled out? And that's how we, we in turn then we train our JPs and we have samples. We, we spend like three hours training our JPs to tell them this is the way you must sign this document, otherwise it won't be accepted at the department. A Justice of the Peace, JP, is a judicial officer elected or appointed to keep the peace. Unfortunately, there may be cases in which one fails to do so. Brianna Williams shared with us the type of behavior that is discouraged among justices of the peace. The main practice we frown upon is charging for anything that a justice of the peace does. Because a justice of the peace is, like I explained, someone who stands out in their community that um, is active and, and um, contributes positively in their community. So anything done as a justice of the peace is voluntary. You're not required to be one if you, if you are asked or if it's recommended that you be one and you feel that you don't have the time or it's not something you're interested in, then just say you decline, you're not interested because, like I said, it's, it's voluntary. You're not supposed to charge. And what happens in the case that a justice of the peace does something to compromise the integrity of that title? If we do get a report about something done that is against the law by a justice of the peace or um, any query if this was right or wrong, we would write to the justice of the peace asking or explaining this was what was reported and you're given an opportunity to write back and, it, and explain yourself. If it is that we feel that, um, you know, you, you still stepped out of line too much or, or it, it is a fact that you are charging for your services, you will you will be removed from the role of Justices of the Peace. Adrian Madrid told us how the association is working with the Attorney General's Ministry to address complaints regarding Justices of the Peace. We always ask them to write, put it in writing for us and now we have somewhere to send it. Then I would send it to Ms. Brianna Williams for she her to look at it, look at the law part of it and then see how we can change um, the system. So we are working together. Mr. Madrid also told us what measures he takes to ensure he appropriately carries out the role of a justice of the peace. Now, if you bring a document and I can see that it's not correct, I will help you. And I said, look, I cannot sign this document. This is how you have to do it. Take it and bring it back to me, then I will sign it for you. Why? Because if I sign a document that's not properly done, you take it, so it's wasting your time, my time, the office time. So that's the job of the GAP, to help the public. He also mentioned that the country can look forward to much improvement in the general conduct of a justice of the peace. I feel good as a founding member of the association that um, we have come a, a long way, but yet we have more work to, to be done. And I believe 
and I feel very confident that with the new Attorney General and Ms. Brianna Williams coming on board with us, a lot of changes will happen. It is important that a Justice of the Peace carries out his or her duty as professionally as possible, and it is equally important that the public follow procedure when seeking assistance from a Justice of the Peace. For release Now, I am Janelle Rodriguez. Three bills concerning the Ministry of Natural Resources were also passed at today's meeting of the House of Representatives. Senator the Honorable Dr. Carla Barnett spoke to us about the purpose of these bills earlier this week. Our Belize Now team prepared this short presentation. In effort to meet the growing service demands within the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Ministry is working on restructuring its departments to evenly distribute and improve the functions of its offices. Honorable Senator Carla Barnett, Minister with Responsibility for the Ministry of Natural Resources, told us why this restructuring is important. The main purpose is for efficiency and for better service delivery. Um, anybody who listens when people call in on the radio, in the morning especially, um, there's a lot of personal experiences that people relate um, about what happens when they try to access services from the Ministry of Natural Resources. And we're trying to fix it by organizing the, 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 the ministry and its departments in a way that will allow them to be more responsive and be able to uh, approve applications for leases, for purchases, for titles in a smoother and quicker way. There's a big backlog at the ministry. We're working to clear that up and we're at the same time working to reorganize so we don't have a, back, a backlog anymore. And how will this be done? The restructuring will be done through the passing of three different legislations, the Land Tax Amendment Bill, the Land Utilization Amendment Bill, and the Registered Land Amendment Bill. We don't have a land tax department right now, so we're putting everybody who deals with land taxes together in one place. Um, we had different little functions related to land taxes in different parts of the ministry, so we're bringing those together into a land tax, a land revenue department. And I picked that one because, uh, to start with because that is the only place in which we are creating a new position. Everything else is about reorganizing existing staff um, and upgrading where, where necessary. The Land Utilization Authority um, amendment is really just to move the Land Utilization Authority from where it is and grouping that along with two other sections that work very closely with the private sector. So um, Land Utilization Authority, um, which comes out of the physical planning unit of the ministry, um, is being grouped with the, uh, the hydrology unit, which everybody who needs to dig a well, everybody who needs to understand what's happening with water flows in their area, that's the hydrology department. And with our mining department, everybody who needs uh, uh, permission for quarrying purposes, for dredging, for all of, and those are really private sector um, activities. It's usually members of the private sector who want to apply for that. And then the land utilization function, which is about people who have land and want to subdivide land and do different kinds of things that, again, those are people who are in the private sector and they want to invest. We have an existing land registry. That land registry is right now designated as a unit within the lands department. A unit means that it, its head, the authority that the head carries is at a certain level. We feel that given the importance of the work of the land registry, the land registry has moved from uh, transacting a couple thousand instruments um, a year to transacting many tens of thousands of <laughs> instruments. Um, and so it's, it, it requires um, 
an ability to make administrative decisions. Um, and it also, because the kinds of, um, of decisions that have to be made within the registry requires that we have people at a higher level in terms of qualifications and experience. So we're upgrading that post. Um, new things have, have come into play um, in our operations over the years since the land registry has been established. Um, the way in which we deal with, um, with managing um, units, um, condominiums, um, you know, that was never there when the registry was first set up many years ago. So with the complexity of the transactions that have to be done, we felt it necessary for us to upgrade the registry, set it on its own. It's its own department, so it can do work at a, at, at, at a level that is required of it now. Stay tuned for more stories after the break. Uh-oh, what are those? Germs! That's right, they're germs, and they love to spread. Uh-oh! And how do they spread? Hands! Germs can spread everywhere from hands, and from hands they move on to food, toys, other hands, and faces. Yuck! Germs make people sick. And that's why it's very important to wash hands. Hooray! It's important to wash your hands, so follow these steps to do it right. One. Turn on the water and wet your hands. Two. Use soap to lather your hands and scrub. Three. Rinse your hands completely. Four. Now that your hands are clean, use a paper towel to touch the handle and turn off the water. Five. Dry your hands with a paper towel. Hooray! Follow these steps every time and you'll keep germs away. So remember, the best way to fight germs is... Wash hands! Checkups. They are not only for babies or persons with ailments. Checkups are necessary for all of us. Knowing your health status is important, and this week we'll share with you what we found out about doing routine health checks. How we get to work is one thing, but what happens after we get there? We probably grab a cup of the good old morning pick me up and settle in at our desks. For many of us, the day's tasks might keep us in our chairs for the rest of the day, and most of our movements will require only a few steps away to the restroom or the printer. With technology offering us quick and easy communication with our peers, there's little to no need to leave our workstations to hold a conversation. We might consider all of this as a convenience, and it is, but a lot of us don't consider the effects of lack of movement on our bodies, coupled with our eating habits. The nutritionist at the Ministry of Health, Robin Daly, told us that these are the reasons to get routine checkups every year. They're very necessary. So um, I would recommend if you're not at any major, if you don't have any major health risks, to do check up, checkups at least twice for the year. Sometimes if you have a health risk, let's say your cholesterol is high or you have high blood pressure, you might do checkups more regularly, for example, maybe every two months or every three months. But once you're in okay health and no major health risk, um, twice a year is ideal to do checkups. What happens when you get a checkup can vary, but according to Daly, a visit can entail just taking basic health tests to check blood pressure, blood sugar levels, and body mass index. 
So those are the three checks we would do. More detailed checks, people would actually check for cholesterol. They would do triglycerides or like a lipid profile test to see. And then normally we would throw in um, from time to time, we would do an HIV test and things like that, just to make sure that more or less the body is functional and there is no risk for other diseases. Belize recently joined the Caribbean region in celebrating the 10th annual Caribbean Wellness Week, which was celebrated in September. It's a week set aside to carry out activities at the national level in effort to increase awareness of non-communicable diseases. The Ministry of Health takes the lead in planning activities at the national level surrounding the theme of Caribbean Wellness Week. Each year, along with those activities, the ministry focuses on health in the workplace and offers free health checks to the public officers. We conducted um, our health checks. We would normally invite public officers to come to the Ministry of Health and do the basic health check, which would be a blood sugar, um, um, blood pressure. Um, they would do their weight, their body mass index to see if they're overweight, look at their body fat percentage, things like that, just so they could be aware of how they are doing in terms of health. One of the ways the Ministry of Health encourages healthy living among public officers throughout the year is through their fitness classes for the officers, which are held every day in Belmopan. The participants can also get involved in a weight loss challenge and do periodic health checks along the way. We spoke to David Diego, the fitness instructor of the exercise classes, about the importance of living a healthy lifestyle. Most of our officers are sedentary, and it is very important that they find some kind of exercise to get them going and for them to do to be optimal at, um, at their job site. So exercise will allow them to do that. The importance of exercise is such that you want to maintain a healthy body. But you cannot work out, you cannot do exercise with a body that is not healthy. And one of the ways that you can achieve that is um, having a proper eating habit and exercise, daily exercise. Um, what, what, what the importance of exercising? Because it eliminates the possibility of you um, becoming obese, which is a problem already in Belize, um, heart disease, hypertension, and um, diabetes. We spoke to a couple of the program's participants about their experience. Dominique Grant has been in the program for three years now, and she told us why she keeps at it. Well, my health, my age, you know, the older you get, more complications you have. Um, now very, very interesting, and I have seen results, so that's why I've been at it continuous. When we um, had a, a session where we went away in, and I found out that I was obese, and I decided that I have to do something um, to get rid of the weight for my own personal health. And that's when I said, well, I have to go now. And I started the exercise program and also a diet program. And since you've been with the program for a while, what would you say to other public officers to encourage them to come out? I would advise them to come out. Exercise, workout is good for your health. You don't wait until it's too late. You do it now and I'm sure you'll get excellent results. The Ministry of Health encourages the other government ministries and departments to take up the challenge of encouraging healthy lifestyles within the office and promote physical activities and better eating habits among the staff. So we're looking at encouraging healthy food at meetings, um, for socials. Um, we're not talking just carrots and celery, <laughs> but you could have nice, tasty, healthy foods. If you know you have many people on staff that like to play football, they like to do basketball, just to get the staff going, doing exercise, doing physical activity together and eating healthy. So we're pushing for that as part of overall wellness for public officers and for the ministries. For Belize Now, I'm Miriam Longsworth. And that's it for this edition of Belize Now. If you want to provide feedback or send in your comments, please feel free to email us at info at pressoffice.gov.bz or visit our Facebook page and let us know what you think. We look forward to hearing from you. Have a great week until next time.